Praise the Lord. You may be seated. So good to see you this morning. Somebody say amen. amen. What a great group. Glad that you're here to worship with us today. Very special day as we receive communion together and take in the Lord's Supper, which is always a very special Sunday around here. So I am so glad that you are here to participate in this. So if you're not glad about it, you slap yourself, wake yourself up. You know, sometimes you, this time of year, you're taking t- way too many antihistamines. <laughs> Those things just kind of give me the space mind. I don't know what it is, but uh, shake them off this morning. Amen? And uh, realize where we are. We are in the presence of the Lord today in the house of God, and we're with God's people and the God's saints. It just doesn't get any better than this on Sunday. Amen? Somebody praise the Lord. God grant us the capacity to understand what we really do when we get here together. You know, that we are worshiping God, and there's something very special in, in God's heart and God's mind about corporate worship. So, we're glad that you're here to be a part of it. Those of you who might be watching our live stream today, uh, come on when you can. Amen. And be a part of what God's doing. You just, you miss this, you miss, you miss so much. It's such an important part of our, our life every week. And uh, I think that Satan does everything he can to keep us from this joint worship and our joint fellowship together and our joint study of Scripture together. So glad that you're here to participate. And again, as I say, especially on this particular day when we're receiving communion and, and the Lord's Supper together. The title of the message before we share in communion is, is communion, a, a call to communion. And really, you know, when you think about everything this represents and all it symbolizes for us, as we stand today, it is a call. It's a call to fellowship. It's a call to, to, to join in, in our relationship with the Lord, to join our relationship with the Lord understand what it is that gives us fellowship and communion with the Lord, and this certainly symbolizes it all. Jesus said it clearly, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So we're remembering the Lord and all that he's done for us today. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we often do, because that is a clear passage of instruction for the church concerning communion. All right, so I'd ask you to stand as we read, and we honor the reading of the Word of God today in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As we share from the Word of God, Paul is telling the Corinthians and literally correcting them in some areas, especially regarding communion and how important it was for their lives and heart to be right and have a full understanding of what they were doing. He said, I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus and the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Someone say amen to the word of God this morning. You may be seated. A few points I just really want to bring out to to help us remember and help us to come to that place in our mind where we are experiencing communion. Remember, uh, communion is fellowship. We've been in a series of messages over the last several weeks, and starting next Sunday, we'll get back to it as we do three more weeks in that series of Destiny Dynamics, the principles for understanding the will of God for your life. Well, the most important dynamics of all had to do with our Heavenly Father. And if we're going to know God's will, we first must know God. We come to a relationship with him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad that God's given us a way by which to know him. We're not left up to our own devices. You look at all the religions in the world that are according to man's devices and not according to scripture. You see a lot of confusion. You see a lot of chaos. You don't know whether to jump, shout, be quiet, stand up, sit down, walk sideways, cut your hair, not cut your hair, or shave your beard. You you know, you just don't know what to do. But the word of God and the grace that God offers through Jesus Christ, his son, is such a simple, clear message of salvation that we cannot do anything to save ourselves, but submit ourselves to God. That God has done everything through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that needs to be done so that you and I can be saved. You and I can be forgiven of our sins, and we can have communion with the Father. Somebody ought to say amen there, amen? Amen. Wake yourself up. We're in church. Hallelujah. (laughs) The communion comes because of grace. Communion comes because Jesus offered his body as a sacrifice for our sins. And he shed his very own blood that we might be forgiven of our sins. The Bible makes it clear that the wages of sin is death. Jesus did exactly what needed to be done to pay the bill, so to say, to cover the wages which we could not cover ourselves. In fact, there's several points just from this passage alone that I want to bring out to you. The first point has to do as we look at, look at this passage of scriptures. It is a time of remembrance. Verse 24 
Verse 25, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. You go back to the gospel accounts. Jesus is in the upper room. He's talking to the disciples. He says, you're doing this in remembrance of me. So let's just do that today. Let's put everything else aside, and let's, re- let's talk about Jesus, and let's remember him today, and let's remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior who so willingly gave himself for us. Now, we know historically that the Jews were having Passover. It was a Passover meal, and they'd come, and the disciples of the Lord Jesus had come to an upper room, which the Lord had designated for them to go to. And as they came into that room, he's sharing with them the Passover meal. And then it says in those verses, and after the supper, he took the cup and he took the bread. Now, remember, they've had Passover. And he's, he's, they've gone over the Passover meal and everything that Passover stood for. Passover is still celebrated today by Jewish communities and, and the nation of Israel. They celebrate this time where they talk about the plight of the Jewish people, God's deliverance by miraculous measures to deliver them from the, the bondage of the Egyptians, and I set them free. Each Seder ends with something like this. Next year in Jerusalem, this particular Passover meal ends with this. Next year with Jesus, amen. He says, we do this until we do it with the Lord one day. Well, may that be next year, if not sooner, amen. Of course, next year is only a couple months away, but that works for me, amen. Anytime, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So it's a time of remembering what the promises of God are, remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, remembering that you can't save yourself. I think there's probably a few folks here in this room who are still stuck on that. You're still trying to save yourself. That is such an empty effort, and it leads to nothing but vain, hard work, which will get you nowhere. I just think if I can be good enough and just be decent enough, and I'm a good old boy, you're a good girl, that somehow when you stand before God, that's going to be acceptable and it's going to cover the bases. No. Because when we discover the Scriptures, when we begin to understand what this communion meal is all about and see what Jesus really did, we begin to understand that none of us can save ourselves. No matter how hard we work, no matter how righteous we become, no matter how high a moral code of ethics we might embrace, we cannot save ourselves. We can't do it. If you could die and give yourself as an offering for your own sins, it wouldn't be accepted by God. You say, well, why not? Because we are stained and blemished offerings. We're stained by a sin nature. But he who had no sin nature, he without sin, he came and he took upon our sin well, Paul wrote to the church, as he who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, let me just hit the pause button for a second. Some of you heard that all your life. In fact, almost as I'm saying it, you're finishing the sentences for me. That's good. But lest it become rote, routine, shake yourself a little bit this morning, and remember, you couldn't save yourself. You might have all that information. You still can't save yourself. Somebody had to take your place, somebody to stand in for you, and the only one who could do that did that. And the only one who could do it was Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And he did that for us. (laughs) Hallelujah. So we remember the high cost, the high price. We pause for a moment, especially as we receive this meal together, and we remember all that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us and that it took him. So that brings us to the second point. As much as it is a difficult time as we recall the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is also a great time for rejoicing. He says, you are proclaiming the Lord's death. Yes, that is somber, and we ought to think soberly about it, that it costs that much, but at the same time, it ought to excite you that God loved you enough to do that for you, that he cared for you enough to save, well, to save my sorry hide, amen, (laughs) to, to redeem me and to love me to the degree that he would take all my sin. Now, you may be a pretty good old boy, a pretty good old girl, but I wasn't. I'm still not very good, amen? <laughs> Don't say amen, Kathy. <laughs> it's tough having your wife on stage when you're preaching. Listen, there's nothing we can do. And until we get that down, we know what a mess we are. There's nothing we can do to get saved, nothing we can do to stay saved. 
We ought to love God. We ought to write, we live righteously. But there ought to be this spirit of humility and rejoices. Thank you, Jesus, that you've given me entrance, that you've given me access into your presence, that you've given me the, the ability to come and stand before you, to present my burdens to you, to share my life with you, to give your life to me. There is this, this exciting, rejoicing attitude that ought to be kind of permeate through all of this as we celebrate, as we proclaim his death. We also proclaim his resurrection that he's risen from the dead. And not only has he risen from the dead, he's given me his resurrection power in this body so that I can live a new life as well. So we want to focus our minds and our hearts to remember what he's done, but also to rejoice and to, to remember that we have what we have by the grace of God and by the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we give thanks. As we celebrate this time of year as we move into November, everybody starts thinking about two things, Thanksgiving and Christmas. But remember, in the midst of all these things, we're planning activities, festivities, events, and vacations, and time off, or whatever it might be. Hey, this is a time for Thanksgiving. We ought to be thanking God daily. We ought to be rejoicing. We ought to maintain an attitude of gratitude. Because if we fail to, then we start getting this attitude, well, everybody owes me something. And nobody owes me a thing. Hallelujah. And we ought to owe no anything but to love them, Scripture says. Let's remember God's grace. Let's remember God's glory. And let's have an attitude of, of when we come to this table of humility and a heart that's, that's open and receptive to the Lord. Which brings me to point number three. If we need to repent, we need to repent. Now, I listened to a few preachers this morning as I was having my coffee and get up in the morning on Sunday morning. I'll skim some TVs and see if I can get some inspiration a little bit myself. You know, I got to have my wagon filled up every once in a while. But didn't get much inspiration this morning. Most of the preachers I went to were all apologizing. You know, and, and if they did mention something about a particular sin, it was always in a lilting kind of forgive me, I hate to bring this up attitude. You know, if we, we, we kind of almost embarrassed to say, you know, folks, we really ought to consider repentance. <laughs> folks, listen, there needs to be a clarion call to repent in our nation. We are in trouble. We know the division. We know the discord. We know the strife. America's suffering great, great division today. Probably like it's been a long time in history since we have been to the place that we are right now. One side blames the other side. One race blames another. It's a sad, sorry time in American history. And it needs to come to place where somebody ought to stand up in the highways and the byways and say, folks, look at this mess. It's time to repent. We need to repent as a people. We need to repent as a church. We need to repent as a nation. But we're all so full of ourselves, we can't even, can't even humble ourselves before God anymore. We can't realize our need for God anymore. We can't recognize the desperation that we are in, and the revelation of God's grace is what we need to experience in our life and come back to the place of humility. We have to come to this place and say, Lord, repent. The Bible talks about this Lord's meal. It says when we celebrate this time and when we come to this time, we ought to come with a heart of repentance. He says to, to take it in an unworthy manner dishonors the Lord. Now, I know we all kind of have this, this pseudo-humility. We say, well, I'm really not worthy. Well, we know we really aren't worthy. And if we left to ourselves, we're never going to be worthy. It's only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that any of us are made acceptable in God's sight. So let me say this to us. When he talks about taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, please understand, he is talking about the way you receive the Lord's Supper. And what does it mean by that unworthy manner? Well, none of us are worthy in ourselves, but he's not talking about you. He's talking about the manner in which you receive it. What should be the manner? The manner should be humility. The manner should be a heart that's right with God. The manner should be a heart of appreciation and recognition that there would be no hope of salvation if it hadn't been for what Jesus had done for us. If he hasn't shed his blood, if he hasn't given himself, then we really have no hope. So it's this manner of realization that, God, I need you, and you're God in my life. It's a manner of inspection, I think, and introspection. It says, is there really anything wrong in my heart? Is there things wrong in my life? There Are there areas in my life that really aren't right with God? Because if there are, then I should repent. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to, to take away our sins. Now, that's clear throughout many places. In 1 John, he says it very clear. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared for this reason, to take away our sins. Now, if he came to take away my sins, then what would I need to be carrying them around with me for? There has to be an abandonment here. If I'm going to receive the Lord's 
supper and communion in a worthy manner, if this represents everything he did to forgive me my sins, cleanse me of my sins, and remove my sins, why do I want to come to this table with my sin intact in my life? Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? I want to repent of my sins. I want to turn from my sins. Now, I'm not up here to be your rule maker. The Holy Spirit's pretty good at this job. But I think it is important that we would examine ourselves and ask ourselves clearly, you know, where am I in my walk with God? You know, where, where am I seriously with him? Am I walking with him this week? Have I walked with him this morning? Have I walked with him this week at all? Is this something I just do on Sunday and I go off on my own the rest of the week? If that's true, then I need to, well, re repent. Am I acknowledging the Lord Jesus Christ in my life? Does he have part and place in my life? Am I surrendering my life? Or am I holding back something from the Lord in my life? Is there something God's telling me to do that I'm not doing? Now, here's what I love about the way the Holy Spirit works. He fills those blanks in real immediately, doesn't he? <laughs> is there something I'm supposed to do that I'm not doing? Or is there something I am doing that he's told me not to do? You see, if I would take the Lord's Supper today, I'd take it in an unworthy manner, if that's true in my life. So you might be thinking, well, I just won't take the Lord's Supper. And I would tell you that's quite foolish. I would say the Holy Spirit reminds us like this in these scenarios and situations so that we will come back to a place of humility, so that we will repent, and so that we will yield our hearts, and so we will get right with God. So I have to ask myself as I come to the Lord's table and say, Lord, you know, I just need my heart to be right with you, and I need my heart to be right with my neighbor, I need my heart to be right with my church, and I just want to be, Lord, clear. Let's set back to that prayer we often mention where David the psalmist is praying, Lord, search me and see if there be any iniquitous way, any sin, any transgression, anywhere in my life that's not right with you, let me know it. Is there something wrong in my life today? Is there something wrong with you, with them, with someone else in my life? Because I need to get that right in my life. I need to be assured this morning, this, the Lord, that you really are the Lord in my life. That I'm not playing church. And I'm not going through the motions. Because the Bible says, if I choose to do it that way, and if I'm just going through the, the motions and playing church, he says, you better be cautious because for this reason, some of you are sick and some of you are weak and some of you have even died. In other words, this is such a, a solemn and a holy time that we come together to recognize the high cost of what it took away to take away our sins, what it took to do that, that we ought to make sure that we've laid our sins aside. If, and, and that this time becomes a time of rejoicing and repentance, revival and renewal in our life. I, I really believe with all my heart, every time I leave a service that we've had communion, I, I walk away in a spirit of revival. But that's what it's supposed to be like, though. It walks us away in a spirit of renewal. So I need to be honest with myself. Am I just going through the motions? Have I lost my vitality? Have I lost my, my passion? Or do I need to make some adjustments in my life? Well, if you need to make adjustments, then make the adjustments. What would stop you? Well, I kind of like what I'm doing. Well, then maybe you need to have your eyes open because what you're doing is poisoning your spiritual life. Whatever that might be, it is wrecking your spiritual life. And although there may be pleasure in sin for a season, it turns bad real quick when it turns bad. And it is like that serpent. You know, it will turn around and it will bite you sooner or later. Our Christian life, though, is constantly, I, I really believe this, this idea of repentance that some people don't like to talk about is it, really a lifestyle for us, isn't it? That we're constantly making adjustments to what the Lord's telling us, and we're constantly allowing God to, to, to control our lives. We're constantly allowing God to, to, to mature us and to grow us and to bring us closer to Him. So that requires a lot of repenting. Amen? <laughs> you, you realize that when a, a Boeing 747 or any jet leaves any airport to go to another airport. It's like if a, if a jet leaves uh, Los Angeles today and it's headed for New York, the several hours it takes to flight, that 95% of the time that jet is off course. And so they have a navigator on board that's constantly making adjustments until those last peak right moments when the plane lands and is right on target. We are constantly in this flux of just, you know, the Lord's dealing with us and speaking to us. There's times when... And, and, the adjustments have to be made. Now, I really believe the longer we grow in Christ, the more we grow in Christ, and the longer we live for Jesus, the less radical the adjustments need to be made. Not having to pull me way out from that direction, but they're more minimalized because I'm learning how to grow. 
I'm learning how to respond like the Holy Spirit and then the Holy Spirit live through my life. But there are places in our life that we have to adjust. And this is certainly one of those times where the Lord tells us, hey, hit the brakes, think about what you're doing. Because then think about what this is. Remember me, remember me, remember me. How often should that, that little sign come up in our life and in our brain maybe when we're starting to move off in some direction and we're not making the adjustment and we're sitting ready to do something really stupid, it wouldn't hurt to have a sign that says, remember me. <laughs> Well, here's this sign well before you today in symbol that says, remember me. The fourth part of this is in repenting that we do reconcile. We're reconciled to the Father. He says, so when a person eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in a, in a way that's unworthy, he's guilty of sinning against the body and, and the blood of the Lord. But what happens when we do what's right? Then we're innocent and we're covered by the blood of Jesus and we're restored so that we can really have communion together and communion with the Father and we're back in a place of fellowship. Now, there's a theologian by the name of Barclay who suggested there's two things from that verse. He said two possible meetings, uh, and he proposes, as well as I do, that both are intended. One is, he talks about a careless attitude that people come and take the Lord's Supper with. Without any concent concentration upon what's happening or what God's done or choices they've made in their life, that there, that there needs to be this, 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 this intended attitude of this is a time of rejoicing, this is a time of repentance, this is a time of remembrance. The second part Barclay talked about was that talking about the body of Christ in general is that you would come to the Lord's table and not be right with somebody else in the body of Christ. So that there's this reconciliation if it, not, if it needs to take place in your life with someone else, that it takes place. We know, according to 2 Corinthians 5, that Jesus Christ came and died and he rose from the dead that he might reconcile us, the scripture says there, we were reconciled to God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word reconcile comes from a, a, a Greek word that has to do with the bringing people into agreement. And it's like this. It's like there are two parties out here that should have been in agreement all along, but they're not. And for some reason, they're in disagreement. And so reconcile means it brings them back to a place of agreement. Now, obviously, the truth is there that God is, and us need to be reconciled. We're separated from God by our sin. So Jesus come and deals with the issue, our sin, and takes it upon himself at the cross. I, by grace, through grace, by faith, trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And guess what? The reconciliation takes place. I'm brought back to the Father, and I'm now in the Father's family, a child of God, because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But that's, that's my father in the family. I have brothers and sisters in the family. You are my brothers and sisters, and we need to be right together. And you know, every family can have sibling rivalries. <laughs> Amen? You may do something, could, no, I don't like it all. In fact, you may do it, and you might not even know I, I was ticked off about it or that it bothered me. You know, I can do something, and it might offend you. I might have had any, any intention of offense, number one, or that did I even know that did offend you? So these are times we deal with these kind of things in our heart and mind. Or if I knowingly offended you, I need to get right with God. And you need to come to me and tell me, hey, you know, we need to get right together. This is an offense that's between us. That's why the Bible talks about bringing your gift to the altar and then go getting right with your brother. You know, it's, it's, whether you've been offended or whether you're the offender, it's always the same. There needs to be restoration and reconciliation. Why? Because we are in this together. And I'll tell you what, if you don't get it right with your brother in the church, God's going to make you live right by them the rest of eternity. <laughs> Just kidding. But it would be fun. <laughs> Amen? So if there's something not right between somebody else, take this opportunity to get it right. Take this opportunity as a reminder how important it is that it is right. Take this as an opportunity to remember that, hey, you didn't deserve the grace of God, but he extended it. So we extend the grace of God to others as we've received the grace of God. That's why it says, forgive others as you've been forgiven. How were you forgiven? Freely. Somebody else paid the price. You might have to pay a price for someone to be forgiven. Pay the price. That's the grace of God. So there's reconciliation that takes place in our hearts with the Lord, with each other. One thing I've discovered in my spiritual life, that if I really want to be passionate for the Lord, we use the terminology on fire for Jesus, that that on fire passion that God wants to ignite in my heart, it cannot coexist with resentment and unforgiveness. One's going to get it or the other's going to take over. 
I can't think I'm any better than anybody else. I can't think that I'm smarter than others. I can't think that I'm more spiritual than you are. I just want to salute Jesus and surrender to him. Just be right with God. But if we're not, he says, we're taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner because Jesus died for humanity and for people. And so we love God and we love people. That's kind of a sounding anthem from Believer's Fellowship over the years. We love God and we love people, but it's more than words. It has to be reality. So ask the Lord today if there's someone that you need to get right with or something that you need to forgive or something that you need to give to the Lord and get over with. Because the scriptures are very clear. that An unforgiving spirit always saps you of spiritual vitality and spiritual power and passion in your life. And it could be the very reason you haven't had the spiritual energy that you used to have and the spiritual fire that used to burn in your bones because you've let situations and relationships that hasn't worked out well get in the way. And you need to be a forgiver as you have been forgiven. Get right with God and see what God does in your life. As always, when we receive communion together, I always ask people to take the time to respond to the Holy Spirit and to, to make themselves available to the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, show me anything that's in my heart and life. So today we're going to do the same thing. There's an altar here. It's for the humble. It's not for the proud. It's for the humble who will to say, Lord, I need to get this right with you. I need to get this thing or that situation or that relationship right. I want to get right with you today, and I want to lay this on the altar. I would say this very clearly today. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God is ready for you to enter into a real communion with him. Your life will never be the same when you surrender your heart to him as your Lord and Savior. He has died for you, and he's risen from the dead for you. He stands ready to forgive you of every sin and wash every blemish away, no matter what it's been, no matter where you've transgressed, no matter what has gone on in your life. God is ready to be the cleanser and the healer of your heart, soul, and mind. Would you let God be God in your life? Would you let Jesus be the Lord of your life? Would you surrender to him? So I want us to stand together as you, and at this day specifically and particularly, to let's consider that what we're about to do is receive communion together and to get our hearts right with our Heavenly Father and to realize that we are accountable and we have a responsibility to respond to him as he leads us. So I want you to make yourself available, Lord. If you want to come to this altar this morning, surrender here, get before the Lord and just say, God, cleanse my heart, wash me clean. I want to be right with you today and I want to honor you as we receive this communion together. I'd encourage you to find your way to the altar today. There's something the Holy Spirit has said specifically to you. If you don't know Jesus, there are men standing here along with me this morning. We'd be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe there's a prayer need that you might have. Why don't you come today? Let's do what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do on this day. Don't put this off, folks. Let's respond to him. Would you come?
may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross. Oh, the wonderful cross. All who gather here by grace draw and bless you. was on. Check, check, check. Check. It was almost on. Okay. There we go. As often as you do this, he said, do this what? So let's just put everything out for a minute. All right? It's all about Jesus. We ask the Lord to take our hearts and our minds. And in this moment, your gentleman will come. In this moment, we just ask for God to bring healing, and grace, and deliverance, and freedom. This time will be an expression of our love and our gratitude for him and all that he's done and all that he is. I shared this morning at the other campus just briefly, and I've done it before in the past here, but I do want to reiterate the fact. I just think it's important we recall a little bit about the first time I received the Lord's Supper as a kid in church. I had gone through the motions of being a Christian, but I didn't really give my heart to Jesus. Some of you didn't know what that experience was like. Some of you gave your heart to the Lord as a child. I didn't. 
But when I got older and I gave my life to Jesus Christ and I remember taking the Lord's Supper for the first time, I'd gotten baptized the Sunday before that, my first Sunday back in church. Second Sunday, they had the Lord's Supper. Reverend Jim Ray Brown was the pastor. And they were going through the motions of passing everything out and the elements out. And I remember how it impacted my life so radically in that moment of just remembering all that the Lord Jesus Christ had done and how powerful that communion service was to me. I was pretty much repentant about taking it all the times I'd taken it as a kid and not really realizing the significance of it. These gentlemen are going to pass this out to you. I pray you'll just get all your thoughts together as they pass this element out to you today. You take the bread, pass the tray to the next person, hold on to it for a moment, but realize what this represents to you today, the precious body of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he was the spotless lamb of God without sin, bore our stripes and our punishment for sin upon himself, pierced on our behalf. Maybe you can remember the very first time it meant something to you. In reality, all the impact of rotten, all that God had done in giving his son for you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, born of flesh, yet God incarnate, God in the flesh. Without sin, the Bible says, the perfect Passover lamb for us. Now, we're not without sin until we've come to him. But thank God it's all been washed away. Thank God for the precious gift of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus took and he broke the bread in the presence and he gave thanks to the Father. Father, we come as well today as we come to remember what took place in that room, birthed out of that Passover meal. Jesus taking that bread, knowing all that it symbolized and how it represented himself, still breaking it knowing he was getting ready to go through terrible, terrible, horrific pain and agony. He in turn gave thanks to you, Father. Lord, we thank you for that precious gift. We do not take it lightly. We value, we understand clearly what it took for us to be forgiven. 
And I ask you, as we take this bread today, to help us fully understand the impact of it and to do it with a recognition of your great grace and your great love. And Jesus, we do this today to honor you and to remember you. He said, take and eat in remembrance of me. It says, in like manner, they took the cup. It was 1973 that year I gave my life to Jesus. I think I brought that up once or twice, haven't I? <laughs> and as he, he gave his disciples, he said, take and drink. Well, it was one cup. We have a cup for everyone today. <laughs> I'm going to ask these gentlemen to take it out, pass it amongst you. You take it and hold it, and we'll take and receive it together and give thanks together. But let's remember all the Lord has done for you individually, your life, your family, your heart, your home. Thank God for His grace, His blessings. Oh, love of Jesus. Oh, love of Jesus. Oh, love of Jesus. It washes. it does that pastor I mentioned a while ago Jim Brown had a way of preaching if he talked about Jerusalem and the Lord's Supper you felt like you were there a very passionate preacher and anointed man of God but during that service then I took the Lord's Supper that Sunday he'd baptized me the Sunday before I uh, was sitting second row first seat on the aisle there. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I looked down that cup as they were passing it out to the rest of the church. And I saw that pure, unadulterated, what the Bible calls grape juice, the blood of the grape. Anyway, folks, I am not lying. It seems so crystal clear in, this, in that moment that the voice of God was so plain and so clear to my heart. I didn't hear it out loud, okay? It's in my spirit. You know, and I'm just now at this point in my life just discovered Jesus and what it means to have God speak to you, so this is pretty cool, all right? <laughs> I'd heard a lot of other voices in my head, by the way, the stuff I was doing, but this was God's great grace. And as I looked down as they were passing it out, I mean, I, I just literally started crying. Just think about all that God had just delivered me from in those recent days and weeks. But here's what I heard, two words only. For you. It was for you. I mean, it wasn't like for you in multiple, all right? It was for like individual, like the Lord was speaking to Joe. It's for you. Now, whether you heard that in your heart or not, you look down on that and you realize this represents the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed understand for you personalize that in your heart for a moment for you now you may have thinking the same thing I thought I don't deserve that it wasn't about my deserving anything it's about the great love of God and the great grace of God and if dear friends if he's done this for you think about it. he's done this for you what are you carrying today 
And what are you holding on to? And what, what burden are you bearing? Or what situation are you facing? What's going on in your life? If he's done this, the Bible said, will he not also give you all things freely in life that are needed? We should remember the Lord. Amen. We should remember who he is, what he's done, when he did it, and how he did it in our life. And as we come to this place today, let there be a heart of gratitude in you, but also realizing there's a heart of application. What he has done is for me in my life so that I can live a life that makes a difference in this world. God loves us so deeply and so dearly. We need to return that heart of love to him. Return to a passionate love for Jesus Christ. So I pray today as we receive this together, it'll be a restoration of passion for Jesus Christ and what he's done and who he is in your life. To return back to the simplicity of God's grace in our life. Let's pray. Jesus, we read in the word you've given us that you gave thanks over the cup and you took from the table the cup of redemption in the Passover meal and you said this redemption that's me well Lord we thank you for being our redemption and I thank you that you did this for me and for each of us here in this room today and let us walk out of this room not being impacted by your presence and by your Holy Spirit and by you Jesus who changed our life so radically who've done all that needs to be done so that we might walk with you and have eternal life. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. And when we drink this today, Jesus, we confess in this moment, we do this in honor of you, and we do this to remember you and what you've done for us. And we'll obey the same words that you gave the disciples to take and to drink. We do so in remembrance of you. Would you drink in remembrance of Jesus? Stand with me and sing that chorus, Oh, the blood again. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. Somebody give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Amen. He's worthy. Make some noise. Hallelujah. Praise God and the Lamb. You may be seated. Aren't you glad you came to church today? It's always a grand time to celebrate remembrance of the Lord's Supper and share it together as the family of God. Thank you for being here to participate in that. Hallelujah. We'll get back to our series next Sunday, but uh, praise God for what he's doing in our midst on this day, and I pray that God genuinely touched your life and you walk out of here with an experience of just knowing God's presence. Amen. Brother Gary, would you come? We have some closing announcements. Amen. Just glad they came to church today. Amen. Let's give a round of applause for the Magnolia Praise Team. They're such a blessing. Thank you all so much for coming out. Appreciate it. While we're here, Sam, it's great to see you and your family here. Amen. Miss Jackie, it's great to see you and Mr. Mike. I was starting to wonder, so I'm glad you all are here together. <laughs> it's just great to have you all in the house of the Lord. Amen. Um, before I get to the announcements, um, I'd ask that we all stand. I'd like to uh, lift up the, uh, the synagogue in Pittsburgh and, and those that suffered that horrific loss and, and just pray for our country, amen? Father, we just come to you right now, Father, we pray for, Father, we pray for the victims and the survivors, Father, of just that horrific 
incident that occurred yesterday, Father. We also pray for the person that just the attacker, Father. We pray for him, Father, that he come to a place of, and, and seek your face and ask for forgiveness, Father. But we do lift up the synagogue to you, Father. Father, we lift up again those, those victims, the, those family members that lost loved ones, Father, and, and, and those that attend that in that city. Father, we pray for our country, Father. We will be a country that goes back to just loving God and loving each other, Father. Father, we're praying for a revival, Father, not only in our hearts, but in the hearts of everyone in our country, Father. We just, that we're united as one again, Father. We stand for you, Father. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So just a, a well, a lot of announcements. Uh, women's social event is uh, November 3rd. You may be seated. Uh, November 3rd, Trip Newman's Castle. Cost is $20. Uh, there's only 15 spots available. Please see Tammy uh, Jacquet uh, to sign up. She's not here today, so... Uh, make sure you reach out to her. You can call the church or, uh, you know, email her, or I'm sure Mr. Larry has some information on how you can get a hold of her. Uh, also, just uh, a report on Friday. At, if you were here at the uh, movie night, that was just a great time. We saw, I can only imagine, it was just a great time. You missed out on a great time of fellowship, a great message, and how it just impacted each one of us just being there. So just be on the lookout for the next one where you can also come and enjoy that time. Kids Bible Club. Uh, starting this Wednesday, they're going to be back in the church, so they're done with the neighborhood uh, sessions where they, where Mr. Pastor Matt goes out to the neighborhoods. But start praying. Uh, he's actually looking for host homes for next year, starting in May, I think. And so uh, what he's wanting to do is have four Bible clubs. So he's not at one, so where the host home would kind of facilitate, lead that Bible study for the kids. He just had great uh, uh, attendance. He, uh, a, stu- a kid was able to get saved a couple of weeks ago that never knew the Lord. So it's just impactful that he's out there instead of in here. And so just be praying that you, uh, if, if you would open your home to be a host home and, and lead that during uh, next year. Wednesday night. So this uh, coming up series is going to be Crown. It's Christians teaching others with needs. Uh, and so that's just going to be a great time of fellowship for the kids uh, Bible club. Wednesday night service, of course, we have that every Wednesday night. Uh, and for those that are that are steadfast and come every Wednesday, thank you so much. You're definitely a blessing to me. And so come and be a part of that. No PM activities tonight. Uh, it is family night. Judgment House. If you're a youth and you're coming to Judgment House, and I think we have our, our max number, uh, we are leave, uh, please be here at 345 so that we can head out. Our appointment is, our, our time slot is 515. It's in Cleveland. So we want to make sure that we get there in enough time so that we can get everybody together and be there. I'll be driving. Uh, Sophia will be driving. So parents, make sure that your kids are here at 345 so we can head out. Daylight savings time. Don't forget to set your clocks back an hour early, uh, an hour back on Saturday night. Do not listen to your bulletin. The bulletin says Sunday night. Don't wait till Sunday night. Do it Saturday night. Uh, Food pantry. Don't forget to stop by the kitchen for your breads and desserts. Uh, Guess if you're a guest, again, it is great. Um, uh, you picked the right day to be here, amen? And, and it's definitely a God thing that you were here. If you'd like to know more information about our church, more information about salvation or baptism, please see our pastor. He would love the opportunity to meet you and put a gift in your hand. Uh, finally, don't forget your tithes and offering. So why do, we, why do we give our tithes and offerings? We do that to honor God, show our love, spread the gospel, gospel and be consistent. Amen. For those on Facebook, you can definitely give by going to our website, clicking on the give link. And also those that are on Facebook, if you have any questions about salvation or church or baptism, be sure to add a comment. We have somebody that is monitoring that and they'll get back to you as soon as they can. Again, are you glad you came to church today? Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.